and starting and finally we are live here in cape town with anthony brooks all the way from the usa we are very fortunate to have uh, lorraine and uh, sebastian join us i'm just going to uh mute them if i can or if you can guys can mute yourselves uh just so that we don't have all the extra sound coming through that's great and lorraine i've just muted you there and uh, we've got a few other people who are going to be joining us we're very fortunate to have anthony brooks all the way from the usa and anthony is a speed cuber what is a speed cuber a uh, speed cuber is somebody who's learned how to solve a Rubik's Cube and attempts to solve it as quickly as possible. Uh, now, we all have different interpretations of quickly. Back in the day, people were able to solve it in 10 minutes, and that was pretty fast. But in the last few years, that has changed. What is the current record for a 3x3, in fact, a regular 3x3 cube? What is the world's record? Uh, the world record, uh, as of this last year, has dipped under five seconds. Under five seconds. That means in order to solve the cube, you have to literally count to five, and before you count to five, boom, the cube is solved. I mean, that is, did you ever think it was going to get to that speed? You know, it's, it's something that when I started cubing, we didn't even think, um, yeah, it's just, as I'm thinking about this right now, um, over the last several years, and I started in 2008, mm -hmm. and now standards have changed between uh, 2003, 2008, 2012, and we're just realizing that these barriers that we think are barriers aren't, they're, they're not out of the realm of physical possibility. So no, I mean, when I started cubing, world class for solving the cube was around a 12 to 13 second average so when you first got into it 12 to 13 seconds is is pretty fast and now all of a sudden we're down to under five seconds do you think we're going to go much further than that well <laughs> clearly there's not there's not a whole lot of room for improvement past four seconds however um average times still have room for improvement as a whole the very best guys um, are reaching the physical limits, but it's definitely hard to quantify exactly what that limit is. Okay, but now you obviously are quite a good solver. What is your fastest time to solve a cube? Uh, my fastest time in competition is six seconds, and my fastest ever is about four and a half. So you've had a four and a half before? Yes. But it wasn't in the competition? Correct. And if it was, I mean, you'd be a world record holder. Right. So how many times do world record holders get less than four and a half while they're just fooling around and go, oh, I wish that was for a competition? Does that happen often? Um, there, are, there are definitely dozens of people who have achieved times that quick. Um, getting a time of that caliber in competition requires a lucky solve that's executed near flawlessly at the right time, which is... In competition. So the more competitions you go to, obviously, the better your chances yeah, absolutely. of achieving those sorts of scores. Wow. I, I, I'm still trying to get my head around, obviously, five seconds, which is, is insane. But, I mean, you've, you've spoken about it, but how do we know that you can actually solve it in, in such a short space of time, in, in, let's say, under 10 seconds? Could we see you do something yeah, like that? Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to put it to the test. So, and I know that we've got Mr. McNulty's group. In fact, what I'll do is I'll I'll quickly go to Mr. McNulty's group then, get a group photo of all of you. Big smiles. There we go. And we've got <laughs> Lorraine over there. We're going to get a photograph of you. And then, of course, we've got Lorne Wabo, who's also joined us here in Cape Town. And we'll get a photograph of you. And Lorne Wabo, by the way, is hoping to beat you on Sunday. He's been practicing. Looking forward to it. And then we've got Govinda in Nepal, but he's not showing his uh, screen. And we had Sebastian in India. I'm not sure uh, if he's going to come back and, and join us. And Tanya Cunningham, she might be joining us as well. Um, okay, so we're going to test to see if you have the ability. So we're going to quickly ask, we've got a small little audience over here, and we're going to ask them if they would like to scramble it. So just give it a little bit of a mix. There we go. You want to come a little bit closer, come a little bit closer so they can all see you. We've got Govan who's now appeared. Yes. 
And no looking, because you might be working out the soul finally. <laughs> Could you do that? Um, potentially. Let, we'll leave it at potentially. Potentially. <laughs> if you mix it up enough, it, it's, it's very difficult to do that. Okay. Are you convinced the colors are all mixed? Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to hold it up so that you guys can see this. It really is mixed. It's, it's, it's not a simple case of a half, half, let's say, two sides already done. We're now going to put Anthony to the test and see how long he takes. Please get your stopwatches ready. Mr. McNulty, I hope your students in the U.S. have got their stopwatches ready. Okay, here is the cube. So what you normally do is, tradition says that you look at the cube to work out the best strategy to solve it. The first few moves. The first few moves, and then the rest you're solving as you're doing it, or, I mean, do you kind of have an idea of how the whole thing's gonna go from the beginning? Uh, well, at the beginning, I planned the first several moves, but then throughout the solve, I'm always looking ahead to the next step. So you actually have to concentrate Absolutely. Well, we're going to find out if that's going to impact on your ability to solve. Okay, so you want to give it a go? Yeah. All right, you ready? Okay, stopwatch is ready. You guys timing? Okay, you ready? All right, can I get a three, two, one, go, guys? Three, two, one, go. go. All right, and we're done. Wow, how long did that take? Nine seconds. Nine seconds. That's not bad. Lunwaba was just smiling because he knows he could probably get it about eight and a half. And that's okay because we're going to keep him on his toes on Sunday at the competition. Um, it's, they're not streaming the competition live, which would be quite cool if they were able to. But we will certainly be filming, filming uh, a lot of it and, and taking photographs and posting them up on the internet. But, of course, solving it with two hands is pretty easy because, you know, you've got the one hand turning and the other hand holding it. But what would happen if you had to solve it with one hand? How much more difficult is that? Um, so the actual solving process is roughly the same, except for the fact that some of the algorithms we use, and algorithms is a term that we use to describe these different uh, solutions to patterns that we have. So when I solve the cube, um, well, when you first learn to solve the cube for the very first time, um, you can learn three or four algorithms and learn how to manipulate those and with repetition, you can solve the cube in several minutes. Mm -hmm. um, fast speed cubers usually, you know, somewhere between 75 and 100 algorithms to manipulate the cube in different ways. That is a lot of algorithms to remember. Yeah, that's... But then once it's in your head, then it's, it's just basically you spit it out at the moment that you have to solve it. You don't really think about that. Well, what's really interesting is it's not even in your head. It's in your fingers. Everything's embedded in your muscle memory. You don't, you don't really even need to think about it. I hope you heard that that he has got memory in his fingers. Forget the fact that he even uses his head. So if we mix it up, how long do you think it would take to solve it with one hand? Let's give it a shot. Let's find out. <laughs> We're gonna choose our studio audience here to come and help us. Your turn, you're gonna get to mix it up. You can see he's got some great mixing techniques. He studied for many years to find out the best way to mix up a cube and confuse someone. Um, some people call it scrambling. I call it my method of actually solving. And, and technically, at the end of my solve, it still looks like that, which I'm sure is actually not what you're meant to do. But maybe that's my skill, that I could probably mix up a cube better than anyone could solve it. And, and I'd like to think that I could keep that skill as something I put on my resume. Do you think it's all mixed up nicely? There we go. Thank you. We'll switch back over here to Anthony. Now, you are right-handed, so I would assume that you would solve it with your right hand. Um, yeah, well, I solve it with my right hand, but most cubers actually use their left because it's easier to use the algorithms that you use for two-handed solving with your left hand because when I hold the cube, I'm going to flick it with my index finger and my pinky. So if you use your left hand, you're able to use moves on the right side and top side of the cube which align more closely with the standard algorithms. However, I, I, in competition, my faster hand to solve with is my right, so I've had to mirror all of those algorithms. Well, we're going to talk about your other hand as well. So let's start off with your right hand, and we're going to get a countdown. Are you ready to do some countdowns? Three, two, one. Go! And I'll just put it over here so you can all see.
I mean, even have the taxis hooting outside <laughs> to cheer him on. And there we go. How long did that take? 18 seconds. What is your fastest time with one hand? Uh, my fastest in competition is 11 seconds. 11 seconds. That's pretty fast. Do you think you could improve on that? Uh, well, well, my fastest at home is seven. <laughs> okay, so 11 can certainly be beaten. Yeah. And are you expecting maybe on Sunday in the Cape Town competition to maybe pull out a rabbit from the hat? <laughs> That'd be awesome. Um, in, in, when it comes to competition times, what's really interesting is on top of an element of pressure, some, sometimes either helping you or hurting you, uh, you have a limited number of attempts. And depending on the, well, every competitor starts with a random position mm -hmm. and every competitor has the same random position. Now that position is sometimes better or worse for you depending on the type of solving you do. You might start with a different color, you might use a different method. And in competition, if you're fortunate enough to get a starting position that's really good for you and move through a solve that's pretty fast, if on top of that you skip a step, that's how, that's how the world record times are set. That is, I can imagine. So it really is the luck of the draw on the day. But of course, you improve your luck the more competitions you enter. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Uh, and, and I mean, are there any times where you've just gone in and completely bombed out? And, and I mean, even young kids coming in and beating you and you just think, oh, this is really just absolutely awful? <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely happens. Everybody has their day. And someday, sometimes you have an off day. And uh, it's important to realize that in a competition, there are typically three to four rounds. And just because you have an off round or two at the beginning doesn't mean you can't pull it together and kill it at the end. Is your technique to go for the fastest solve or to get the best average or a little bit of both? Which is your strategy generally? Well, the, the method I use to solve the cube is definitely geared towards a faster average overall. Mm -hmm. um, so, and also in, <laughs> that works out pretty well for me because in competition, when it, when, it, when it comes to advancing through the rounds and placing at the end of a competition, we go by the average time, not the single time. Okay, so, so just for those of you who don't know, at a competition, uh, they don't only measure the fastest speed, they also look at your best average. And what they do is they take the fastest and the slowest time away and then do an average of the times that are left over. Is that correct? Correct, with five solves in each round. Okay, and, and I mean, it's, it's a long day. I mean, you, you, you don't only do three by threes, you also got the pyraminx, which looks a little like a pyramid, and, and we'll have a look at one of those in a second. And, and of course, you've got the two by twos, you've got the single-handed solve, you've got the double-handed solve, um, we've got the four by fours. What, what else do we have? Those are all the events we're hosting at the competition this weekend, but in total, there are, I believe, 16 official events that are hosted at various competitions. So it would make sense to host them over a couple of days if you have so many things. Yeah, definitely. Okay, all right. And, I mean, when did you first start with, with cubing? I started in 2008 when I was 14. Okay, so Mr. McNulty, I'm not sure what the average age is of the students in your class. Let's just quickly zoom in over there. Um, how old are your students, about 14 or so? 12 and, 12 and 13. 12 and 13. So you guys, I mean, you could get started with cubing right now, which is round about the age that, that Anthony started. And I mean, you could then become a world champion. How long did it actually take you to learn how to solve the cube? Because once you've got that, then it's just obviously practice and time and, and, and effort. Yeah, exactly. Um, the f when I first learned to solve the cube, it probably took about four or five hours total. Um, I was on a long road trip to run a cross country meet and one of my friends could solve the cube in a minute, minute and a half. And he was the fastest person at my school. So I thought that was pretty cool. And we were all bored looking for something to do. And sure enough, he had a few Rubik's cubes on him. He taught me and a couple of friends how to solve it. And actually, when me and a couple other guys were learning, I was definitely the slowest one in terms of picking up the individual steps. Mm -hmm. But once I had got them down and figured it out, um, just like you said, it came down to practice. And I realized, 
okay, I like doing this. I can definitely spend time working on these different elements of, of speed cubing to get faster. So I did that and pretty quickly I, I moved up the ranks at my school and then was the fastest at my school. And that's when I found out about real official sanctioned competitions and got involved in that world. And how has that been so far? I mean, you've probably traveled around the world to various competitions. Yeah, it's been amazing. Um, over the course of eight years, I've competed in over 80 competitions all over the world. I was in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil for the World Championship last year. Uh, Which you came second in. Yeah, I placed second in the 2x2 event. In the 2x2. So obviously in different events, that's, that's very cool. Yeah. And you've been to the East? Uh, I have not competed in Asia yet. Mm -hmm. However, uh, you know, Asia and Africa were two two continents I was hoping to cross off my cubing bucket list. And I'm in South Africa right now, so I'm well on my way. Well, there we go. And you did obviously quite well in the Johannesburg competition, but now there's still the Cape Town, and that still forms part of Africa. So you could improve on your performance from last week. Oh, absolutely. And you're looking forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to post some of the photographs and, and exciting news about Anthony uh, achieving uh, some new records. But Anthony's not the only cuber in his family. Who else does cubing in your family? <laughs> well, the, the, first, the first people I taught were my younger brothers. One of them got really into it. The other one does it, but he doesn't compete. Um, the, the one who doesn't compete can still solve the cube in about 40 seconds on average. And my youngest brother, who's really into it, he, uh, his fastest average in competition is under 12 seconds. Under 12 seconds. That's But... Here in South Africa with me, I have the current Jamaican national record holder for the Roots Cube. We are going to have to check out the <laughs> current uh, Jamaican champion. We're going to turn it around, and, and who might that be? Hi, <laughs> <My> Mom. <laughs> so, of course, <laughs> Anthony brought his mom with him to South Africa, and she is, because she's from Jamaica, she holds the Jamaican record. Is that right? And you broke it last weekend while in South Africa. Six. Six national records. And she will be entering in Cape Town. And hopefully she's going to break some more records. I think it's fantastic when the whole family can cube together. Of course, while you guys are cubing, I'm sure your brother's just busy playing tennis and, and having a lot of fun. <laughs> because he's not really into the cubing as, as much as you guys. Is that right? Everybody has their own thing. Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. But now, of course, not only is, is cubing... Uh, a wonderful opportunity to, to learn and develop. Um, there's, I would argue that there's a lot of mathematics in it. I mean, how many possible combinations are there uh, if you had to just try and work it out on your own? Can we get a few guesses? Let's get some guesses. So we're going to ask over here, studio audience, and Mr. McNulty, get your students thinking. <laughs> how many different possible combinations are there? So in other words, if this is one, that's two, three, for how many different ways do you think you could arrange the cube uh, to work out the possible numbers of, uh, what is the best way to describe it? It's the possible number of combinations to, to manipulate a cube. Is that correct? Sure. I, I, I would describe it as the, uh, the number of unique positions. The number of unique positions. How many do you think there are? 100 to 150. We've got takers for 100 to 150. Mr. McNulty, let's get some guesses from your group. We have 100 to 150. Do you have any takers for more than 150? Go ahead. What's your answer? Ahead, what's your 43, answer? Quintillion. 43 quintillion. Oh, we've got 43 quintillion. What, what is 43 quintillion? A lot of zeros. <laughs> How many zeros? Uh, you see, Google only gets you so 15 far. zeros. 15. How many? 15. 15 zeros? Uh, it's 18 zeros. It's 18 zeros. And uh, yeah, you're, you're right on the money, but the, the exact number is 43 quintillion, 252 quadrillion, 3 trillion, 274 billion, 489 million, 856 thousand different positions. That would have been my second guess. <laughs> and the only time you ever see numbers that big uh, are when you look at national debt or when I jump on the scale. But I'm amazed. So many combinations, yeah. then yeah. 
you obviously don't have to know all of them because to solve it, you have to just follow certain algorithms. Is way less than four forty-three quintillion algorithms well, you need to remember. Well, yeah, the the process of solving the cube is essentially uh, solving individual parts of the cube in like succession without messing up what you've already done. And ultimately, once you get to the last step, you've reduced the cube to a position that you know exactly how to solve. And then once you apply that final algorithm, everything So as done. you start getting from one step to the next step, uh, oh, we've got uh, some students at uh, Mr. McNulty's group who actually have records that they would like to share with us. Mr. McNulty, you've got some students who've got some records there. Let's hear about it. Awesome. Go ahead, guys. Explain. Oh, I got 30 seconds as my speed. It didn't send. Oh, it didn't send. I hear you. 30 seconds is next. I think it's muted. No, it's not. <laughs> um, I got 43 seconds. That's impressive, too. And now I think they've switched off their volume. And make sure that's not me. No? Go ahead. I got 44. Oh, go. Okay, so okay, so it's a 43 and 30 and then? 44. 44. That is really, really cool. So, you know, you the guys are in, you're in Newtown. Is that correct? How Newtown, far are you from? Newtown, Pennsylvania. So, how, how far are you guys from, like, New York side? I mean, you're about, what, a three-hour trip? There are competition. Are there competition? Do yeah. people actually go to Pennsylvania to have competitions? People in Pennsylvania compete. What? Did you know that? <laughs> well, I hope that you guys are going to compete because, of course, if you take part in the competition, it allows you to get an international ranking. And that's very important if you want to grow up uh, and, and move up the ladder when it comes to uh, cubing in, in, in national and international competitions. And, of course, one day we could be interviewing one of your students, Mr. McNulty, um, who would be willing to come to uh, South Africa? I mean, Vish is it Vishvak? He's got 30 seconds. That's impressive. 30 seconds. Very impressive. So, I mean, you've got some talented students in your class already. But you know, we've seen Anthony solve with two hands, we've seen him solve with one hand. I think we need to see something a little bit different. What would happen if we asked you to uh, do what kind of solve should we try? I, I can definitely use some other puzzles and show you um, some cool stuff that I've got in this bag. Okay. Oh, he has a I bag know, of we, goodies. We were talking about the pyramids earlier. Mm -hmm. I've got one of those right here. Um, and if you haven't yet learned how to solve a Rubik's Cube, pyramids is probably a good place to start. Um, another puzzle we mentioned, uh, what, what was my best event at the last World Championship is the 2 by 2 um, a lot of people try to start speed cubing with the 2x2 two two instead of the 3x3 three three because it seems like an obvious go-to. But I would argue that it's actually better to start with the pyramids. It requires far fewer algorithms. There are less pieces to solve. And ultimately, if you solve a 2x2, two two, you're going to have to learn quite a bit of information to be able to do that. And you still won't be able to solve a 3x3. Three three. So... If you want to get into cubing and you're not Vishvac with a 30 second solve already, uh -huh. I would say get a Pyraminx, start with this, and then work your way up to a three by three. And uh, you guys, can I get both of you to scramble these, these for me? Okay, we're going to get our official egg scramblers. They're going to scramble. Here we go. You can do this one and you can do this one. And while they're scrambling. Oh, okay. Or oh, they're doing some great scrambling. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Is it mixed? Uh, there's a little bit of a, a little bit of blue. We just don't want too much blue. Oh, mixed. this looks mixed. And yours? Very good. As you can see, you can uh, check them out. They look a little bit mixed. I'm going to turn around now to uh, focus on Anthony over here, and I'm going to. Turn this up so that we can see the actual cubes. You want to hold it up 
Just about the little window there so that we can see I've them. got to set one down to solve the other, though. Uh, so. Okay, all right. <laughs> so you're going to solve one at a time. All right. Uh, I'll start with the two by two. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, put that in place there, and then we can finish it off with that. So that took, what, less than three, four seconds? That was two seconds, maybe? Probably about two and a half seconds. Two and a half seconds. That's pretty impressive. And now the pyramids. All right. Man, you, you are... Very good scramble. All right. Here we go. How long did that take? Oh, you had a continental record at one point for the pyramids. I did. What was that record? Uh, 3.6 seconds. 3.6 seconds. That is pretty fast. And that obviously depends on the, the scramble. Yeah, for sure. Wow. And now, when they do the scramble, how do they know how to scramble each cube? Because if you're doing a competition, everyone has to have the same scramble. Exactly. Um, so in competition, we have computer programs that will generate um, I'm trying to describe this without, in terms you'd understand, but uh, we have Rubik's Cube notation where we'll have letters indicating which side of the cube to turn and whether we turn it clockwise or counterclockwise. So for ex an example, an R would indicate that we're turning the right side clockwise and an R prime means counterclockwise. So in competition, we have computer programs that'll generate a string of approximately 25 letters that will take the cube to a completely random position. Is there a way to mess with the algorithm to make the solves much easier? Uh, theoretically, yes, you could do that, but obviously the programs we use in competition are worked out to be completely random. The official thing. And, right. then, and then, so you, so what happens is all the cubes are solved and then they put into these scrambles, and then all the competitors for that round will do the same scramble. So it's not like the luck of the draw for you and, and for the next person. Everyone has that same scramble. Yes. What happens if someone sees a scramble by mistake? Does that mean you have to then redo all the others? Um, well, we, there are measures in place to try and prevent that from happening, but when, when incidents do happen, um, we usually don't scrap the entire set of scrambles for the round. But that particular competitor may either be penalized, or if it wasn't, if it wasn't, you know, his intention to see mm -hmm. the scramble, he'll be the individual that will get a extra scramble. But now there are some very technical things in a competition. So, so for those of you who haven't ever taken part in an official competition, there's a special timing device that you have to use. Um, it's a device that you put both hands on, and as soon as you take them off, the timer begins, and as soon as you put your hands down, the timer stops. So it's completely driven by your own movements, and that makes it quite fair that not, not someone else is, is stopping it too early or too late. And, and then, of course, Mr. McNulty, their class is, is running out of time, so we're just going to quickly say goodbye. So we'll say bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> and we're looking forward to hearing about your cubing heroes. I hope they do well. Thanks a okay. lot. Thanks. Bye. And, and then, of course, when you are doing the competition, I've noticed that when the cube is solved, it, it, it would technically look like this, but then sometimes it could look a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. And you put it down, you go, solved. Mm -hmm. And they go, ah, 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 ah. What is the ruling on that? Right. Um, so if a cube isn't completely aligned at the end, if it's only a little bit off like this, it's still considered solved. But if it passes the 45 degree point, so if we have it like this, where it's going to be a move off, so if we have anything, anything more than 45 degrees, it, it's considered a move off. If it's one move off, you're given a two-second penalty. So two seconds are added to your time. And if you happen to, unfortunately, have more than one move off, it's a DNF, which stands for did not finish. And that solve will count as the worst solve of the round. So that will be the solve that's tossed out as far as the average goes. Wow. Have you had any DNFs? Yeah, many. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you see, he is human, and that's very important to notice. So now, of course, when you are doing, 
you know, these sorts of things. People obviously, they get excited about what you do and, and you've now started turning it into a business. Yeah, I, I mean, I do, I do stuff like this where I'll talk to schools and uh, there's definitely um, a lot of value in the principles that can be taught through speed cubing. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've got speedcubes.co.za here in South Africa and they are selling speed cubes that you could buy. And, and, and with the invention of the 3D printer, I'm starting to see some incredible designs coming out. How on earth do you solve some of those ones? Because they're not just a regular shape. Some of them are, are, are rectangular. Some of them have got like many different layers within layers. How do you go ahead and solve those ones? Do they all follow the same algorithm? Um, so there are, there are, I mean, probably hundreds of different variations of Rubik's Cube-like puzzles. I would probably describe them as twisty puzzles. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these puzzles do follow the same set of principles as Rubik's Cube, and you could apply the same algorithms to solve it. Many of them, though, will move in different ways. So you can't apply the exact same algorithms, but you can apply principles that you learn through these algorithms to develop new ones to solve those puzzles as well. Wow. And have you seen any interesting ones recently? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time solving, solving the standard Rubik's Cube. So I don't typically venture out and solve these crazy variations. But at competitions, uh, kids will have boxes of just dozens of different cubes. So that's usually what I'm exposed to. I'll show up to a competition. I'll kind of be in the zone practicing. And I'll look over to the left and be like, what the heck is that puzzle? It has 14 <laughs> sides, 150 different pieces. Like, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> and, and I mean, are you curious enough to, to give it a, a shot? Oh, I, I mean, I, I love to check out the puzzles and, and play with them, see how well they turn. That's pretty interesting for me because um, when I got started cubing, even the standard three by three, um, the mechanism did not allow you to turn it as smoothly as you can now. So I'm always very interested to see how these different variations of puzzles are developing in terms of the actual mechanism. Mm -hmm. But as far as solving goes, I usually don't spend enough time on them to actually figure it out. Um, but kind of going in line with the whole mechanism thing, some, uh, one puzzle that really blew my mind uh, just recently, this is, I, I bought this in Joburg at the competition okay. actually. Mm -hmm. um, this is a standard three by three. And there are variations of three by three cubes that are larger. The pieces are just larger. It's the same puzzle. It's just a larger version. And they have never been very good at all. Mm -hmm. They've always been very slow, very stiff. Yeah. Some and, and pieces yeah. fall out. Not speed cubable at mm -hmm. all. But I just got this guy. <laughs> okay. And what is that one? I'll, I'll show you how this, this, this works. Can we get another mix up and I'll give you a demo on this larger okay. cube? We're going to... Get one of our top scramblers over here to give it a good mix. Oh, you've got some great color schemes going there. Do you reckon it's all mixed up now? Almost. Oh, and he moved the middle bit there. Now I think you've got him. Oh, he's got you now. Sweet. All right, let's see. All right, so as I said before, I had, up until this past Sunday, I'd never seen a cube of this size that, that could be solved very fast. So pretty excited about getting this guy. All right. Okay, you got a timer? You ready to rock and roll? <laughs> Done. How long did that take? Ten seconds. That's pretty good for a cube this size. Yeah. Do they go any bigger? Um, they they definitely go bigger, but this is the biggest I've seen that can be manipulated that well. Wow. And it does make a difference that you you you're buying. I mean, the regular cubes are obviously quite stiff when you turn them. Um, these are designed to obviously move faster. But do you find that pieces pop out quickly because you're moving at such high speeds? Um. A few years ago, yes, but these, these, there are constantly new models of, of Rubik's Cubes being developed, and every year they're just getting better and better, where despite turning faster and more smoothly, they're 
also more reliable where they don't have pieces popping out. They don't really have corners twisting as easily. So we're just, I mean, these cubes when I started were probably like, uh, I don't know, they were like Pintos and now we're working with Porsches. So it's just- Well, there we go, from Pinto to Porsches. <laughs> but now you held a record a couple of years ago that put you in the Guinness Book of World Records. Yes. What was that record? Uh, that was the record for the most number of Rubik's cubes solved underwater in a single breath. Now, that's not an easy task because obviously solving when you have air around you is one thing, but solving underwater means the mechanisms don't work the way you want to and you're fighting the force of the water when you're turning. So, so that obviously impacts on your speed at solving. How many cubes were you able to solve on one breath? Uh, I was able to solve five. But that wasn't your best though, because it wasn't like you had been practicing for a long time for this record. You only found out the day before that they wanted you to do it. Right. Who even thought of that? <laughs> um, well, at the time I had been, I, I was a consultant putting together the current uh, Beyond Rubik's Cube exhibition that's traveling the world. It just and that was working with Erno Rubik's himself. Correct. He was the guy who actually invented the, the Rubik's Cube. And once he invented it, it took him how long to actually learn how to solve it? Because he couldn't solve it himself in well, the beginning. No, I mean, no, it's not one of those things you just pick up and solve. It took uh, Professor Rubik himself a month to solve the cube for the very first time. So he invented it and then he couldn't solve it until about a month later. And now all of a sudden, uh, I mean, looking around the world, five seconds here, six seconds there, it's now quite commonplace. And, and you were putting together an idea for the display of the Rubik's Cubes over the years because they were celebrating a certain anniversary, weren't they? Well, so the, the exhibition was put together for the 40th anniversary of the Rubik's Cube. 40th anniversary. And it's a, uh, it was a $7, $7 million, 5,000 square foot exhibition that encompassed all different aspects of cubing. Um, I was a consultant specifically on the speed cubing aspect of the exhibition. Um, there's other stuff about the history of the cube, different applications and inspirations the cube has had on math, science, um, art. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, it's a pretty fantastic exhibition if you ever have a chance to visit it when you're nearby. Um, maybe and, we can get it to come to South Africa. Yeah, maybe so. Where, maybe where is so. it now? It's in China at the moment, but maybe we can convince them. Would you put in a good word to earn? <laughs> maybe we can, Definitely. we can get it to the side because I think, you know, if we had it over here, more people would be interested in getting involved with, with speed cubing. For sure. But now, going back to the event, yeah. so you devised this idea of climbing in a tank and solving underwater. No, so where I was going with this is that the science center that I was working at with this exhibition, I was, um, so I was a remote consultant and then I was the speed huber in residence at the Liberty Science Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was there, we hosted the US National Championship. And it wasn't until the day before the start of the championship that uh, they came to me and said, hey, you know, we'd like for you to set a record tomorrow. And they had a list of several different official Guinness World Records. And uh, the one we decided on was taking a stab at beating the underwater record. And at that stage, it was four cubes on one breath of A. Yeah. And you managed to get five. Right. And, and we, you know, Finding out the day before when I was giving it a shot, uh, it was, I mean, five wasn't easy, um, especially given the fact that I neither had trained for it nor figured out the proper technique as far as the breath holding is concerned. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was pretty excited when after, after solving that fourth cube on the big day, I could tell I had enough air in me to, to last and midway through the solve, I switched and finished it off one handed. So you could have probably done six maybe if you'd push yourself a little bit? Yeah, potentially, but I figured, okay, the record was four, you just I had do to beat five. It as long as I beat it, that would leave, that would leave clear room for improvement so I, should, I could come back and get it again. And uh, one of my buddies, Kevin, actually beat me to the punch and he's pushed the record up to eight cubes currently. Well, we thought, you know, it would be not fair to, to, to leave it at that point. So on Friday afternoon at the Cape Town Aquarium, uh, Anthony into a tank uh, with a live turtle and some stingrays and a whole bunch of other fish. No sharks this time round. Mm -hmm. And we're not going for a world record, but we are going to go and see what you can do underwater because yours is fresh water. 
I'm going to assume that seawater has, plays a different role when it comes to moving the cube as well and the buoyancy and that sort of thing. I haven't done my research on this topic, so okay, I have no so, idea. <laughs> oh, I love it. So real problem solving in, 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 the, in, in the wake. But now, of course, being a Cuba, you travel around the world, you get to meet some very interesting people. Who are the most interesting people that you've met in the work that you've done? Well, um, when I was at the Liberty Science Center, we definitely had some amazing people come through. Um, one of my favorites was definitely Gary Kasparov. Now, if you're involved in the chess world at all, you know exactly who he, who he is. Otherwise, you may not. But Gary Kasparov is widely considered to be the greatest chess player of all time. Um, he retired from competitive play several years ago. But um, you know he, he is someone who has definitely changed the game. And uh, I, was, I was stoked to meet him when um, <laughs> this event was coming around at the Science Center. Um, he, he was somebody that, well, when I was younger, I was very involved with chess. Um, I played competitively for seven years and um, was a highly ranked player in the States um, before my cubing days. So cubing came in and I started playing less chess, um, which, which is interesting. Um, the, the, the parallel between chess and Rubik's Cube has always kind of fascinated me because people assume that solving the Rubik's Cube requires math, but the analogy I like to use is that uh, solving the cube is much more similar to chess in that uh, the strategy and logic, the principles behind those things, can kind of be carried over from one discipline to another. So, uh, yeah, so chess and strategy has always been um, pretty fascinating for me. So meeting Gary Kasparov, somebody who had attained that level of proficiency, is it was amazing and it was it was actually uh one of my favorite moments in in yeah i mean thinking about it now i haven't i haven't thought about this in a long time but it was amazing i because i was expecting to be the one that was blown away and i was but gary gasparov was amazed by by the way i could solve a rubik's cube and he was I mean, he was really excited. He was bringing his daughter over to take pictures with us, big smiles. Like, it was amazing. So that's why quite surreal. My, my mom was there. She'll vouch for me. It's, it's all true. That is quite surreal. So, I mean, there you are meeting the guy that you look up to most. And I'm sure that when kids come to the competition on Sunday, you know, and they're very into cubing, they're going to get a chance to meet you. And, and, I mean, you might be blown away by some of them coming to meet you because... At the end of the day, I mean, they might be able to solve something in a nine years old, solving it in less than a minute or something. But I mean, Gary Kasparov, of, of all people, and he looks up to you and the way you solve the cube, it must have been quite a feather in your cap. Yeah, it really was. That's cool. But now I've heard a little rumor that he's not the only celebrity that you've got to meet. There's a certain well-known magician. Are you allowed to mention names? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can definitely mention uh, a couple names. Um, so a few years ago, I um, it was actually also through the Liberty Science Center. While I was the speed cuber in residence at the Liberty Science Center, David Blaine was the magician in residence. So um, See, I don't know what I'd do if I got to meet him because I mean that would be a biggie. I mean, <laughs> just the the kind of personality that he has, and he's very, you know, we're gonna do some magic today, and it's you know so unassuming. But when he does those tricks, generally, wow. I yeah. mean, he's, he's very talented at the delivery of some of those tricks. Yeah, he's and some phenomenal. are there to shock you, obviously. But, but in general, he's just, I mean, you see magicians all the time. And, and some are quite grandiose and, and will try and make a statue of liberty disappear and whatever. But he comes along. He likes to do street magic, in-your-face type magic, which is very impressive to watch on TV. But you got to meet him in real life. Why would he need to connect with someone like you as a speed cuber? Well, uh, you know, we met when we were both performing at an event. And um, one of the things that, that immediately struck me as I got to know him a bit more was the element of realism he has in his magic. That's been by far the most impressive thing um, that, that I've experienced in terms of magic. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there's always an explanation or a trick behind magic. And the way in which David Blaine takes seemingly impossible stunts, he's big on these stunts that he does. Mm -hmm. And 
what's really crazy about them, um, well, he, so last year he released a special on ABC called Real or Magic. Mm -hmm. And um, while he was filming that, I was actually traveling with him for a couple of weeks. And I saw him working on some of these, these tricks. But many of them are, are only tricks in the sense that um, there's an explanation behind them. They're not tricks in the sense of being an illusion. What he's doing is real. He's actually doing whatever he's saying he's doing. And that was a special release last year, Real or Magic. Um, about two weeks ago... He just released a new one. Exactly. He released his, his following special called Beyond Magic. Mm -hmm. And you can check that out. Um, it's on ABC. And it's really phenomenal because everything he does in the show, all of the tricks are genuinely real. And what I find brilliant about it is throughout the special, he actually explains exactly what the process he was, exactly what he had to undergo to attain this skill, to be able to pull off this illusion. And he's very upfront about exactly what he did because it's not about fooling you. It's about showing you what is truly possible if you put your mind to it. But now you have very strong feelings about magic and, and doing tricks when it comes to solving cubes. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I know that right now that on TV there's a lot of uh, excitement about magic that is done with cubes and if you watch America's Got Talent there are a couple of guys that well one guy in particular who's doing some amazing tricks but there's something that there's a message that you want to get out to people about the difference between just the magic and the mechanics behind it can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that sure um I guess my thoughts on the matter are, are simply just the fact that there's magic and there's realism and um, I, I'm, I personally, I'm not a magician, but I do have a lot of respect for, for magicians who put in a lot of effort to create an illusion. I mean, they're able to give you a moment that you wouldn't otherwise be able to have. Mm -hmm. And um, that's pretty amazing. Um, but as far as, you know, the Rubik's Cube's concerned, obviously I'm a purist. Um, the, the, the things I do with the cube are real. Um, so, yeah, so you, it's you just, learned, for example, turn a cube into flowers because that's not really real per se that's just an illusion but i mean you you could do certain tricks with a cube that would appear to be an illusion but it's it it's the real thing well well what i'm saying is when i solve the cube one-handed or you know in six seconds or put on a blindfold and solve it all of these things are skills that i've worked at for many years to be able to do proficiently and I guess, I guess the message I, I would want to send as far as that goes is just that um, uh, there, there is a difference between magic and speed cubing. And, that, and it's simply that, like, uh, you know, magicians doing their thing, is, that, that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. I, I know many magicians, I'm very impressed by them. Um, but when it comes to, to solving the cube and I guess Rubik's Cube magic tricks, since you mentioned America's Got Talent and there was a magician on there, Stephen Brundage, who who does Rubik's Cube magic tricks, which are very impressive to watch. Um, but yeah, there, there definitely is a difference between um, a magic trick where you toss the cube behind your back and catch it solved, and uh, you know a genuine solve where you can put it back together in six seconds. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Now, of course, you do a whole bunch of tricks. I mean, you can juggle and solve cubes. You can solve cubes blindfolded. Um, but obviously, time-wise, we don't have time to, to go through all of that. Um, if I wanted to get started, you've put some stuff on your website. Can you tell us a little bit about that for, for beginners who want to learn how to, to get into cubing? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you're just starting to get into Rubik's Cube solving, YouTube is your best friend. Um, that's where the vast majority of people get introduced to this world, and there are lots of tutorials on there. Um, if you want to be pointed in the right direction, you can check out my website, which is brooksCubing.com. And we'll put the, the title with all the information with the YouTube video as well. Yeah. Cool. And, and so on your website, they can actually learn, they can watch tutorials and learn how to start cubing. Yeah. And give or take, if, if they were a, a good student, how long do you think they could pick it up? If you're patient about it, um, I would say realistically, it takes, I've taught lots of people how to solve the cube. And, uh, 
depending on your learning style and the exact tutorial that you're watching, it's much easier to pick up on how to solve the cube and understand what's going on for some people who are fortunate enough to watch the right video versus mm -hmm. others who are a little confused. They might not understand the notation or the principle may not be taught in a way that's very simple for them to, to pick up on right away. Mm -hmm. um, so the message I have there would be to be patient. And it could take three hours. It could take six hours. But it's probably not going to take more than about six hours. So wow. just be patient. You can break it up over the course of a weekend. My mom is over here saying it takes days, but <laughs> <laughs> but but that's what it, it takes. It, if you if you're solving the, if you work with a tutorial for an hour a day, then yeah, it will take six days. So it could take a week to solve. But in terms of the actual time spent learning the steps, um, it is important to be patient and work through it um, step by step. So if you rush through the tutorial and you just expect to be able to solve it after watching it a couple of times, then yeah, that can be confusing and lead to taking even longer to learn how to solve it. But when you solve the cube, there, there are set steps. Um, the first one you'll most likely start with is solving a cross on one side of the cube. So definitely what my advice would be here is when you first pick up the cube, you watch the tutorial, figure out what's going on, solve the cross, then stop, pause the tutorial, solve the cross 20 times before moving on to the next step where then you learn how to solve the corners of that layer. And then once you've learned that principle, repeat that process 20, 30, 40 times, then move on to the next step. And if you do it that way, I promise it won't take you too long to learn to solve the cube. Okay, so there we go. You guys have heard that it can be done and, and maybe you've got six hours before Sunday. So you could be entering the competition. Is that right, boys? Maybe, maybe. Are there any questions? Do you want to ask any questions? You, you've got a question? Sure. What would you like to know? So the algorithm, like one algorithm, is that like as long and the same principle? Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, a lot of people are confused um, as to whether the algorithm indicates a specific pattern or an entire method. And it's definitely just that specific pattern. And the way that's arranged, um, so the Rubik's Cube notation that I described earlier is, is letters. So an algorithm will be, um, you'll learn through a video tutorial that, well, I'll, I'll give you a demo of an algorithm. Um, so I have a solved Rubik's Cube right here. If I were to, if I was in a position where I wanted to switch the position of these two corner pieces and these two edge pieces, I will perform 14 moves that we call a T permutation. So this is a 14 move algorithm that will swap those two pieces and those two pieces. So when you're first learning to solve the cube, you won't have to learn many of those different algorithms. And most of them are, they're generally pretty short, usually uh, seven to 10 moves. And they'll be written out like R, U, R prime, U, um, and, it can be confusing to learn those initially, but um, as you as you play around with the cube and kind of are able to visualize where the pieces are moving to, um, that's kind of the first step to being able to, to solve the cube. But it actually gets much easier over time mm. because instead of having to remember, okay, this goes here, that goes there, your fingers just pick you can, it up, you see the term, and boom, boom. it's just done. Did that make sense? Okay. Now I know Lon Wabo has told us that his battery ran out, but he wants to know how do you prepare for a competition? Um, Push-ups, <laughs> hamburgers. Um, I would do that because it would help me. Prepping for a competition. Um, yeah, I guess a few pieces of it, pieces of advice would be one: making sure that your algorithms that you're going to be using are secure. So you definitely don't want to be learning new techniques right before competition. Mm -hmm. You want to practice solving with just what you're going to use in competition. Make sure you have those down because with the added pressure of the clock and an audience and the fact that this is you know, an official setting, uh, it can give you the jitters and make it more difficult to recall these algorithms unless you really have them embedded in your muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and do people put earphones on and, and zone out of the things around them or what, what is your technique? 
Yeah, I mean, some people do wear like headphones, and and you can't listen to music when you when you're solving the cube. But but they do have these big like soundproof headphones. But that's usually worn during the uh, blindfolded events. Mm -hmm. um, my technique is is a little simpler. All I do is. I'll take a moment, um, the cube will be ready, there'll be a judge waiting for me to indicate that I'm ready to start the attempt. And I just take a moment to kind of close my eyes, meditate, just take a deep breath. You know, it can kind of feel my heart rate settle a little bit. And then I just kind of look up, say I'm ready, and get in the zone. And then you just go, wow, 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 wow. Well, all I can say is that uh, we're very excited about having you in Cape Town. We are even more excited about having you take part in the competition on Sunday. Uh, hopefully, you'll get to see a little bit of Cape Town while you are here. And we want to thank all of you for joining us uh, this evening here in Cape Town. It's, it's uh, just after 7. Uh, thank you for joining us live in Lorraine. And, and we had Sebastian from India and Mr. McNulty in, in Newtown, Pennsylvania. And we had Mombwabo from Cape Town. And I know that we had a whole bunch of people watching it live on the internet as well. And hopefully people who will be watching this afterwards um, to maybe pick up some ideas or tips from, from Anthony. So thank you very, very much. And what we normally like to do is end off with a bit of a photograph. So we're going to kind of lean in a little bit here. And we're going to... Uh, Ines, Lorraine, you got a question? You want to ask a question? No? She's, she's shaking her head. <laughs> okay. So we're going to lean a little bit so we can get so we can see ourselves in the actual photo. And we're going to try a screenshot. Is that your best smile, Anthony? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boys, we need you to come and join us as well. You guys all could. We need Anthony's mom. Come on, you're going to be here too. Come, all of you, all of you. We're going to take a selfie. This is so cool. And Mr. Beer, what are you talking about? You're going to be there too. The whole crew. Okay, so we've got everyone squished in. And we'll take another one just in case. And right, let's just clear that one away. And big smiles. Got it. There we go. That is so cool. Thank you very much. We're going to stop the broadcast over here. Thank you, Lorraine, for joining us. I hope you're well.